Well, good afternoon to all, everyone who's still awake. You have to be after Satyajit's talk. <laughs> and it's hard to follow him. OK, uh, so I'll give you a little piece of what I have done and what I do. Um, I work at the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance. Uh, and the, the, the joke in the office is that the CEO stands for Chief Excuse Officer. <laughs> OK, so I was asked to tell you about me. Uh, so I grew up in an era where there was no Google, which meant that we had time to read. And there are uh, off-target benefits for that. And play, not a video game, but actually play outside, which built camaraderie, a, a sense of competition, healthy competition, and hung out with friends most of the time, real friends, not your virtual Facebook friends. Uh, and again, that has its off-target effects. My education, uh, I studied chemistry at the BSc and MSc levels at Aligarh and IIT Kanpur. Backed off to US for a PhD. And then when it came time to do a postdoc, I had the same dilemma that you know, you've heard some other speakers talk about earlier. Uh, whether to go to a very well-established lab or to go to a lab that is just starting a young PI. I chose the young PI uh, because I thought I was changing fields. I was going from, from pure enzymology into molecular biology. So I thought it would be good to learn directly from the PI rather than from a senior postdoc in a big lab. And that turned out to be nice because uh, we had a fun lab, as you can see. And, I've not put a picture of the, of the place or the lab, but a hiking trip. Uh, that's what we did a lot. Uh, so it was a fun place to, to be in. And compared to what's happening today, I had a fairly brief postdoc, only three years. Uh, today, I see people are doing you know, two, three postdocs, seven, eight years, and burning themselves out in, in a postdoc. And by the time they get to their first faculty position, uh, they really are a lot of times at a loss uh, what to do. Uh, so that's, that's briefly my career. Why I chose a career in virology, and this, this picture uh, actually uh, depicts for me uh, in many ways why I wanted to do virology. Can anyone of you in the audience take a guess as to what I'm showing? OK. I'm, I'm showing influenza virus budding from a cell. So that's one infected cell throwing out so much flu virus. And that's, that's something that, that fascinated me as I was coming out of graduate school, that you know, viruses being so small, such limited genomic space can actually control uh, an organism that has a much larger genomic space than they do. Besides being awfully beautiful structures. Uh, and I, I really got really fascinated with viruses, became obsessed with viruses. Uh, and my level of obsession is sort of shown in this, uh, in this uh, piece, which uh, I picked up from, from Australia. And it, it is in my office. I look at it every day. And I, uh, Aborigine art, I started looking at viruses in this. So I, for example, thought that uh, this was a cell membrane. Uh, this was a virus being released from a cell, a virus infecting a cell, and you know, man surrounded by viruses and all kinds of weird things. So I, I became sort of possessed with it. OK, so my work experience. That's the next thing I was asked to, to share with you. So I was a bench scientist for 30 odd years, uh, which means PhD, postdoc, and being a PI. And even while I was a PI, I was a bench scientist for much of my time as a PI. Uh, and I, I heard that postdocs, once they get into industry, 
they stopped working on the bench, somebody said this, and uh, that's really awful for a scientist to do. Uh, I spent about 25 years in leadership positions, and when I say leadership, I mean writing and reviewing grants, getting money to do the research, uh, writing all those awful manuscripts that kept getting rejected, and rewriting them, and you know, making sure they got published. Uh, but more importantly, as a, as a scientist, many of you don't, don't realize this, but a lot of time of a PI goes in managing people. So it's not very different from what people in industry do or, or otherwise. I also spent about 15 years in science management and policy Thanks to all the DBT committees that Satyajit and I have shared. Uh, thanks for all the uh, policy-related things we talked about, their sharing experience with people in my lab, institute, others. And in general, I have an interest in people. I have an interest in training people, in mentorship, in writing. Writing, I find to be therapeutic. And I also have, a, have interest in reading science, history, traveling, photography. I have all sorts of interests. So then after about 30 odd years as a bench scientist, I decided to make a career change. And this pretty much depicts my career change. So I went, went from being a research scientist who's always begging for money <laughs> to heading a funding agency uh, that's, that's funding and science policy. Uh, and the best part is I'm not handing out my own money. I'm handing out somebody else's money. Uh, that's, that's great. So I, you know, we, we look at grant applications, and uh, this one thankfully says approved. 90% of the time it says rejected. Uh, but that's what I do now. I work at a funding agency. Uh, which most of the time we, we fund research, but we also at least think a little bit about policy issues. So this is where I work, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance, uh, and this really provides opportunities in biomedical research for young people to launch and establish their careers and for not so young people to get into leadership positions. We fund basic science, we fund clinical science, we fund public health. And we do this funding through a fellowship program where there are four career stages at which we fund people. An early career fellowship is typically given to people uh, who are zero to four years post PhD in M or MD. And I'm very pleased to see that two of our early career fellows are actually organizing this meeting. That's, that's wonderful. The intermediate fellowship is given to people who are four to seven years post-PhD, senior fellowship to seven to 15 years, and Mark Dashi fellowship is more of, a, of building a center of excellence. So that's, that's what I manage uh, at this time. So about my job, uh, my job responsibilities are to manage a funding portfolio which is worth roughly 1,300 crores over 10 years. Uh, and the, the responsibility really is, really is to organize a fair and transparent system for selecting and supporting the best people. Uh, the, and the aim at the end is to really produce the next generation of leaders in biomedical research in India. Um, and I do this by managing a team of about 20 people. Uh, we have two office locations. Our secretariat is in Hyderabad, and we are, we've almost opened a, a small office in Delhi, which should be operational in the next two weeks or so. We also do a lot of outreach, take, go to places, tell people about our programs, uh, and sort of invite the best people to come forward and apply. Why I love my job? Uh, because I, I constantly meet people, I have an interest in people, I'm constantly learning uh, every, 
every meeting, every experience, I think, should be a learning experience. And I learned from a lot of young people, a lot of very bright people, who are our applicants, our fellows, committee members, all sorts of people. And really, I, I feel that if I do my job well, if, my, if people in our office do their job well, we really have a potential to promote world-class research in India. It's not that if we are not there, world-class research won't happen in India. We are just you know, one more cog in the wheel and perhaps a catalyst, if I may say so. What I don't love about my job is living out of a suitcase, which I'm doing right now. And being a virologist, I know that too much travel is bad because there's too much influenza on airplanes. Think about it. You're in a closed space for two hours. All the air is being circulated. Great source of respiratory infections. Find a cure. <laughs> right? Find a cure for that. Yes. I'm hoping some of our fellows will do that. Should be out to the audience. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I was also asked to give job advice for whatever it's worth. Uh, so how to prepare for a job in grants management? This is what I do now. I think that the, and this is something you've heard all morning and you will keep hearing all day. Do well in whatever you do. I mean, you're going to start in research, do well in research. I think that your basics have to be right. You have to be a generalist first and then a specialist. Somebody said this in the morning. All experience is important. No experience is, is worthless. Learn from every experience. And if you're going to be in grants management, as Satyajit was saying, job satisfaction for a, for a grants person, have a genuine interest in helping people. And, and really be generous with, with your time and advice. Uh, but you know, unsolicited advice is also not taken kindly. So make sure that advice is asked for. Very important, learn to share credit, which, which somehow I feel that people, at least in our, in our research environment, are, uh, are losing sight of. They're not sharing credit with, with their younger colleagues as much as they should be. And leadership really is all about giving credit. Very important for not just people in grants management, people everywhere. If you're a scientist and you're not reading outside your immediate field, that's a disaster. Because all, your, all the best ideas that will come into your research will not come from your own area. They'll come from outside your area. So think about it and read outside your area of interest or your area of immediate research as much as you can. What is the profile of a grants advisor that we hire, for example? So we hire, everyone we hire as a grants advisor has a PhD. Most people also have some postdoc experience because these are people who read through grants, who decide who is going to be the referee on this grant. Is, you know, so they, they, they make those decisions. And, for, and therefore, it is, it is important for them to also understand the science that is in a grant. They should be able to multitask and to write well. I think this is, an, this is an area which is not covered in most of our graduate schools in the country. If you are going to be a scientist or if you're going to be in any science-related things, learn to write well, learn to, to communicate, and I think Pallav and others will talk about it. <clears throat> you should also have decent IT skills and not be afraid of uh, spreadsheets. But lastly, I mean, don't do it because you think grants management is going to be easy. Don't do it because bench research is tough. Don't do it because your papers have been rejected or you've not been able to get funding. Those are all the wrong reasons for going out of research into research management. Again, unfortunately, a lot of that has happened at our funding agencies, and that's part of the problem. But hopefully that will be corrected when some of you young, successful people will get into this field. OK, so I'll give more advice. What is the expected remuneration for starters? 
when we hire people at that level, it's anywhere from about 60,000 upwards. What are the prospects for growth? Are there jobs in India? Well, grants management is still an upcoming field in India. Uh, and I feel that as the funding increases, as the volume of funding increases, so will the need for professionals to manage it. India is currently spending about 0.9% of its GDP on science. For the last 10 years, I've been hearing that this should go up to 2%. Uh, well, if it goes up to 2%, there will be more jobs, right? There'll be more money to manage. Uh, public and private research organizations are also hiring people with skills in this area. And I can tell you that when Welcome DBT India Alliance started, the six program officers who were trained at the very beginning, we have only one left in the office. Five of them have gone to other places, have gone to hopefully better places. So there is room for people who are trained well. But your employability and upward movement will also depend upon your soft skills. At that point, it will not matter what papers you have published or what you have done as a postdoc once you are in grants management. What is the channel to look for jobs? Well, the channel is the usual channel, nothing special. So some general advice. And this is something about job versus career. Know the difference. What is a job and what is a career? A job is something immediate. A career is something that you plan. For a job, these are the essentials. So you need to write a CV that is actually read and not thrown away in that black box that, again, somebody talked about. You write a cover letter that grabs attention. Don't just send a CV, expecting people to read a CV. And these days, it's happening a lot. Somebody will send you a CV without even writing a single word in the email. Or just say, please see attached. <laughs> and once you get an interview call, don't blow it. A career, if when you're planning, you should really be asking these questions. What is, some, what, is the, what is it that I'm good at? What do I enjoy doing? What am I, you know, when am I really happy at work? How do I manage my career? Think before you start your job hunting and avoid this getting into this trap of, trap of I want to get a job now. Plan your career. What's a good CV? One page. Nobody has time to read more. A CV should have personal data. It should have background, your work experience, higher education, your, merit, your academic and personal merits, your publications. Usually, you can put them in an appendix. If, again, I'm talking about it not from getting your next postdoc, but from a different angle here. Language skills, you should rate your language skills in your, in your CV say anything you have about your IT knowledge, keep it one page, and if it goes up to two pages, you describe your work experience and be result-oriented. Don't just, don't tell what, you know, debate you won in your high school. Nobody's interested in that. How about a good cover letter? Again, one page, make it a business-style letter, and don't start it, I beg to state that. <laughs> We've seen a lot of those, don't do that. It should have a professional and personal content. Address it to an individual. Every organization has people in leadership positions, people who make decisions. Have you spent the time to find out who that person is? And if you have, address it to that person. You should name the job you're applying for. If you don't, it goes in the black box. A short intro. Number one sales pitch is, why did you apply for this job? Why you are perfect? What are your aspirations? Number two, work-related, choose two examples. Tell, tell people your experiences. What are your hobbies, interests, what motivates you? And a short closing. 
don't say I remember for a, for a, forever your humble servant. <laughs> you know, please. And proofread, proofread. Spelling and grammatical errors are a big, big turn off. Finally, the interview. Dress code, important. Know something about the organization you're applying to. Listen, and I've just listened to that. OK, and finally, there are some all-time favorite questions that come for an interview, at, and here are those. I saw this in Nature last week, or you know, two weeks back, PhD overdrive. And the most important thing is here. An excess of graduates means that job seekers need to be versatile, important, develop soft skills. And keep asking questions. If you want to ask me any questions, that's my email. Thank you.